we may have a few folks joining and, and straggling in, but we're going to go ahead and get started so that we can make sure you have plenty of time to ask all the questions of our experts today. Um, I'm Dan Pennington. I'm the president of the Vail Health Foundation, and welcome to our first learning lab uh, hosted by the Vail Health Foundation. In July, we, with the uh, wonderful philanthropic gift of Mike and Mary Sue Shannon, we launched the Behavioral Health Innovation Center at Vail Health to research novel um, therapeutics for treating depression, anxiety, anxiety um, post-traumatic stress disorder, and other uh, initiatives, uh, or excuse me, illnesses. Um, the first study is going to be an opt-in study focused on how to use psychedelics optimally and it will assess the use of psilocybin on depression and anxiety. And today we have Julio, Dr. Giulio Tononi uh, from uh, University of Wisconsin and Dr. Chuck Razon, a lot easier to say than... than uh, people mess my name up a lot. Do they really? Yeah, you just know me better. That's right. All right. Uh, we're very fortunate to have these two world leaders in the field here to share their knowledge with us today. I'm going to let them do a further self-introduction uh, and not read all of the talking points that are here for, uh, for them because we'll be here all day. They are clearly uh, outstanding in their fields um, and having come from Kansas this weekend, outstanding in their sunflower fields. So uh, come on up and we'll uh, let you get started, Julie. Thank you, Dan. And uh, thanks for attending this and also for having me here to participate in an initiative that I must say is as important as it is timely. I went around a little bit and I'm a psychiatrist myself and so I think I'm very sensitive to the mental health crisis we are all faced with and the initiative that's being taken here to address this crisis is unique and really radical in a way. So I do very much hope it succeeds because we all need that. Now, Chuck Raison and myself think very much alike. And we decided to do it this way today. He's going to give you some concrete steps that can be taken very soon to actually begin to address this crisis. And I'm going to have the task of providing you with a very, very broad overview what I think the fundamental problem is and how at the level of the territory it may eventually be addressed best. So I'm going to give you a very, very high level picture, which I hope will not scare you, but there is something important here. And it has to do with what is the root cause of this mental health crisis that we are facing, perhaps more than at any other time in history. You know, people may complain that it is the social media, the TikTok culture, that it is consumerism, that it is the apparently steady decline of the spiritual traditions. I think it's a little bit also the fault, or rather the consequence, of science. Science itself, and I'm a scientist. Science, with its success and its power, has taught us something people have essentially accepted without thinking too much about it, and certainly scientists by and large have. And as I will mention towards the end, I can call them four fundamental displacements that have occurred since the time in the you know, late 16th century when Galileo started the scientific revolution. That was the idea that while we thought we were at the center of the universe, each and every one of us, Instead, we're just a, you know, a speck in the periphery of a vast, you know, unforgiving universe. We count for nothing, in essence. And then there was Darwin, and the idea that rather than being the pinnacle of creation, we are just the product of chance and necessity. So no matter what you do in the end, it's your genes, it's your environment, you just are along for the ride. And even worse, is the neuroscience revolution, in which I'm immersed myself, which essentially has convinced most of my colleagues that we are essentially biological machines or biological computers. 
that there is a complicated machine, I'll tell you a little bit more about that, the brain, that runs through the motions and we are carried along by it as an unwitting passenger. So it's not really our fault, it's not really ours to do, we don't really have free will, we don't really do or can do anything to ameliorate mental illnesses, it's just the machine that does what it does, okay? And now finally there's one more displacement, which is artificial intelligence. You all know now about the explosion of chat GPT, et cetera, and robots that may sooner or later, in fact, pretty soon, it looks like, do all the things we do, give better answers than our best friends, know about us more than our spouse. And all of these things, you know, we will begin to think that not only are we not at the center of creation, but we are also sort of peripheral because cognitively we are not much worth. There are things that are better than we are. So no wonder, this was my very, very long introduction to say why there is in fact an additional reason for a mental health crisis. No wonder if you are a young person in this world and that's essentially what you're imbibed with, that you feel meaningless, that your life is just going to run on among billions of other lives in a corner of the universe with machines that are going to be smarter than you are. So no wonder there is a problem of meaninglessness, which I think is the root cause of much mental health. And no wonder we need to do something radical about it. Now what I want to convince you of very briefly is that a lot of that has to do with what science has done in its attempt since Galileo to remove the subject you and I, the conscious being who actually does science, scientists are conscious too, from what is being studied in order to be objective and therefore powerful, but remove it such that essentially the soul has literally been lost. In science, there is no soul anymore. The soul is something that, according to the majority in science, is sort of a pre-scientific, primitive notion of spiritual traditions we know better now. Okay, we understand the brain, its mechanism, and so on. So at the heart of it all is consciousness, which is the title of my talk. Okay, consciousness, because it is the key thing to unravel, to know our place in the universe, and therefore also our meaning, and the meaning of our life. So let me first define what that is, very briefly, in a way that we all understand. It's very easy to define it in the negative. It's that thing that goes away when you fall into dreamless sleep or if you're hit on the head, okay? You lose consciousness. And what happens when you lose consciousness? You lose everything. You don't see anything, you don't hear anything, you don't touch anything, you don't think anything, you don't remember anything, you don't feel any emotions. Everything is gone. So as far as you are concerned, each and every one of us, there is nothing at all. So imagine that for a moment. Just think we are all unconscious for a moment. We all get hit on the head. And there is nothing at all. Okay? Now, oh yeah, we think the mountains are still there, etc. But with nobody around to look at them, would they really be there in a meaningful sense? This is a teaser, but it's important. For each and every one of us, consciousness is all there is. There's another way more positive to define it, which is, just to keep it in mind, to be conscious is to have an experience, any experience. You see me, you hear me, you think something, and so on, you're having an experience. And therefore, it is all we have and all we are. Take away consciousness, there is nothing left. Okay? So it's rather important. It's not just some additional little thing. It's everything. Another way to put it is what it is like to be. So if you're conscious, there is something it is like to be you. If you're unconscious, there is nothing. So I think with this, I can move on to what instead the standard scientific view is. So let's forget the soul, consciousness, etc. You know, Let's study what's actually there. And what's actually there is, of course, the brain. We all know that if I hit you on the head, you lose consciousness. So it has to do with the brain, or at least some parts of it. And the brain is indeed a very complicated machine, no doubt about it. For instance, the cerebral cortex, this part up here, has roughly 16 billion neurons, which is a big number, but really not different from the number of transistors in an iPhone. Okay? What it does have that's remarkable is 
100 trillion synapses, the connections among these neurons. So that you don't find in an iPhone. But it depends how they are arranged. In fact, I want to point out one thing to remember. It's just one very basic thing. Consciousness very much depends on the cerebral cortex, especially some parts of it, as we will see. But if you look down here, the cerebellum, which is this piece back here, it's smaller, but it's very dense with neurons. It's like a super highly populated region of the brain. It has 70 billion neurons, so five times more than the cerebral cortex. Incredibly complicated. They respond to sensory stimuli, they have motor actions, and so on. You take it out, so you throw away four-fifths of all the neurons in your brain, and sometimes surgeons must do that. And what happens is nothing. So what happens is you are still there. You still see and hear and think and feel. You have some problems in locomotion. You go around a little bit as if you were drunk. Okay, So there are some problems. But consciousness, which is what matters, is unaffected. So it's not just a matter of being a biological machine. Okay? There is something special. And of course, you can study the brain at many levels of resolution, from regions of the brain to mini columns, to neurons, the cells, to their connections, to the in vesicles inside, and so on and so forth. So to the point that, you know, since science studies the machine, a long time ago, more than 300 years ago, a great German philosopher, Leibniz, pointed out right away what the problem was. It became known as the hard problem. And in fact, consciousness is usually considered the hardest problem of them all, together maybe with the origin of the universe. But Leibniz said, and he used the most complicated things he knew about, which was a mill. He said, well, a mill is a machine. You walk into it, you enlarge it, and what you find are gears, you find ropes, you find wheels, you find all kinds of stuff. But ultimately, it's a machine. Nowhere will you find any consciousness, any perceptions, he called it. Nobody having a feeling of any sort, seeing the blue of the sky. Nothing of the sort. You just find the machine. And the brain is the same. We constantly work on the brain. This is a section to the brain with all the connections that you can now see with MRI. And this is what we do in the lab, for instance, using electron microscopy. What this is is a synapse. So one of these 100 trillion connections. And all these vesicles here contain a chemical, a neurotransmitter that gets released. And then that release is producing an activation here on the other side on another neuron. And that's basically what goes on in these 100 trillion synapses. It's a giant system that's constantly exchanging electrochemical signals. That's all you're going to find. And yet, Almost all my colleagues are convinced that we are, after all, either a machine or maybe better, that's what everybody thinks, we are a computer. So there is some software, so to speak, running on the machine that performs certain functions like image recognition and talking and so on, very much like chat GPT. It can listen and it can talk, and it's pretty smart, okay? So ultimately they think we are some kind of primitive chat GPT that's implemented on this slow, frail, perishable biological machine. Okay. That's how science sees it. But that is absurd. And by the way, as Leibniz so, it really makes you think that consciousness, the only thing that exists for us, is literally a miracle. Okay? It's like transforming the gray waters of the brain into the phantasmagorical wine of experience. Okay? So it's a miracle. You can't do that. You go in, you find neurons, they fire, they they release transmitters, and then there you are with your feelings, okay? A miracle, and it can't be a miracle. Science needs to take a different tack. And so the main point, and this is really very much my life's work, I decided to work on cognitive when I was 16, and that's why I studied psychiatry and so on, is we don't start from the brain and try to squeeze consciousness out of it. You'll never squeeze consciousness out of the machine. You start from consciousness itself, what it is like to be us, what we experience, and then ask, what does it take to have it? And can we test that? So the approach is then to move from phenomenology, which means consciousness, means experience, to physics. After all, as I said, unlike Galileo, 
we are doing the physics, we conscious subjects. Okay? And that way, I think, we can make progress. So the progress is embodied by this theory called integrated information theory, or IAT, which I obviously, don't be scared, won't present. You know, I am going to hold a summer school every year in Venice in 10 days from now. It's eight days of full immersion in this to get down to this. So I cannot do any justice to the theory. I just want to tell you that there is a substantial body of work that really takes the properties of consciousness and says, what do we need? What kind of substrate do we need in order to have it? And why does it feel the way it does? Why does space feel extended time, flowing, object, like they bind some general concept, like person with some particular features, why red feels like red, and so on. So all of that. And you know, the essence of the theory is expressed in this particular slide that says any experience, any experience, like when you wake up in the morning and before there was nothing at all, and then suddenly there is you, your body, your bed, your room, and the mountains outside the window. Okay? When you wake up and suddenly everything comes into being, which is your experience, your consciousness, what does that entail? And the idea is that there has to be a substrate, so something made of things you can, as a physicist, manipulate and observe, there's nothing magical here, that has to have the properties that consciousness has to begin with. And this property, which are here, basically means you need some substance that's incredibly densely connected, such that no matter how you cut it, you lose a lot. And there's not much in nature that's like that. You know, neurons have 10,000 connections, each of them. They receive them and send them. Transistors have two or three. Okay? So there's something very special. And some parts of the brain are very densely connected, satisfying this requirement here. There has to be a complex that's very tightly woven together. And then there is another key aspect, which is you need to look at all the powers of this thing, which is what we call this phi structure or cause-effect structure. Don't worry about the names. The idea is that in the end, any experience should be identical to this thing we can actually work out in principle for simple systems, for our brain, not even remotely yet, but the idea, I think, is there. And it, the form of this thing, of this structure, captures completely what the experience feels like. And this quantity, phi, which is the sum of this amount of irreducibility, how much consciousness there is. So there is a scientific way to find out whether consciousness is present or not, how much, and in which way. And now forget about it, because obviously I cannot and I will not explain it. But I want to just point out that there is something, and with that something, we can actually then ask, can we explain some basic facts about consciousness in the brain, which are worth knowing? Okay? Facts like, I told you before, this is a scan of a brain in action, an active human brain. This is the cerebral cortex. This is done like this. And this is the cerebellum. They're both active, whatever you do, they all do all kinds of stuff. They are complicated machines. But as I told you, the cortex matters. In fact, some parts, especially in the back, matter. The cerebellum doesn't matter at all, even though it has five times more neurons. Or this. I've been studying consciousness and sleep forever. In sleep, early in the night when you fall asleep, you cease to exist. If I wake you up, we've done it on hundreds of subjects in the lab. They come out, and regularly they say, I wasn't anywhere. I come out of nowhere. There was nothing before. That's the usual thing we get. Okay? So there was nothing. And their brain, however, is not shutting off at all. It's just as active and when they are awake. So you need to explain that. Okay? That's one of these basic facts. If you don't understand that, you understand nothing. Or this is a seizure. When a person has a generalized seizure and they fall down and they shake like this, for instance, they lose consciousness, but the neurons become even more active. So why? These are the kind of questions we can actually address and test the theory that way. And the theory, for instance, can explain very well why these parts of the cerebral cortex, indicated here, can support consciousness. Is because more than anything else in the known universe, they are incredibly integrated, tightly interconnected, nothing like it. 
And that's exactly the recipe that IIT, the theory says, is needed to be conscious. Conversely, the cerebellum, despite its huge number of neurons, is like a bad modular society where nobody talks to anyone. They all are little modules that do their job and they talk, talk to each other. By the way, maybe in this audience, maybe worth mentioning, especially in many years past, I was making the case, here I only have two examples, but that the right anatomy, the right connectivity for conscience is this one, is tight interconnections among specialists. People, so to speak, these are neurons, that do different things, but do it together, very closely integrated, like a good community. Modular, everybody on his own, not good at all. If everybody is connected to everyone without specialization, they all obey the same orders, that's a totalitarian society, that's terrible too. Okay, so it's just an interesting thing. To be conscious, you need the right kind of organization. Okay, so and then the other thing, just to mention it is, I told you that even if you have the right anatomy, if you fall into dreamless sleep, you lose consciousness. So why is that? The theory explains it very well. It says that it is because the causal interactions within this densely interconnected part are lost that you are lost. And indeed, when we go, this is work we did going inside the brain of epileptic patients so we can record the interactions. Won't explain how, but in essence, you see that while the neurons are active, they don't talk to each other anymore. They cannot really affect each other well, and that's when consciousness is lost. We can also explain why it feels the way it does, why space feels extended, as I told you, and ultimately, you know, why time feels flowing, and so on and so forth. All of this can be understood now properly based on the way some parts of the brain are organized, how the neurons are connected, if you have the proper understanding of what consciousness is. And I close here with a very, very brief introduction of what the theory can and wants to do. I'll move on to a little bit of what you can use the theory for, not for explanation, but for prediction. That is, can we actually make predictions and test those two in a way that's novel and that can actually help us even in diagnosing consciousness disorders, as you will see? And the answer is yes. We've been doing this for many years now. That was the first study. We used transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is a way to knock on your brain without going in, and then we record with electroencephalography the reverberations of the activity of the cerebral cortex. And in short, if these reverberations are complex like this and they go all over, it is consistent with high integrated information, this quantity phi. So when you're conscious, that should be the case and that's what we found. Whereas if you same subject, fall deep into sleep, dreamless sleep, early in the night, and consciousness is lost. The brain is still there, the connections are still there, the neurons are still firing, but when you knock on the brain, you get a very stereotypical local response, just as predicted by the theory. And this now can be exploited in developing tools to actually measure consciousness, which is something we sorely need because, believe it or not, until now, the way to know whether somebody is conscious or not is to ask them. <laughs> and if they answer, we conclude, well, they are. And if they don't answer, then all bets are off. Okay? Now keep in mind that we ask Chad GPT, they always have an answer for us and a very articulate one to boot. Okay? So just keep that in mind. Well, most patients can't even begin to answer, but they may be there. And this is why this is clinically very relevant. We transform this into essentially a way to get a number out of the complexity of the response of the brain when you knock on it, based on the theory. And if this number is high, we can conclude that the person is there, whether or not that person can respond. So they may not be able to say anything, they may not be able to move, they may not be able even to move their eyes. But if we knock and get that complex response, we are now basically sure the person is there. And that's very important because in vegetative patients who have been there maybe for months or years sometimes, you don't really know. And we now know that roughly up to 40%, between 20 and 40% are conscious. And so that's, of course, where you should concentrate efforts for rehabilitation and so on. Not only there, a very, very important aspect is in the intensive care unit. So I've learned it rather recently, I must say, that it's up to 80% in this country of people who have 
brain trauma, for instance, or cardiac arrest, and in the first two weeks after they get to the ICU, they actually very often have a withdrawal of care decision made. So they are unconscious, or rather unresponsive, and then it's decided that, you know, since we don't know better, okay, 80% withdrawal of care. Now, with, we're trying to, you know, get essentially this kind of machine into the ICU and see whether we can actually tell the person is there, despite the fact there are no responses, to help in make informed decisions. And also prognosticate, because if you are conscious, it's very clear that you're much more likely to then get out of the state of unresponsiveness. There are other experiments, many more. I'll just quote you know, one to you, for instance. We can do something very simple that had not been done. We can compare brain activity when you are dreaming, which is a kind of consciousness. You have experiences. You see, stuff. last night I dreamt of skiing. You know, so evidently there is something of you know, the environment here that helped me. <laughs> it, uh, I dreamt of other things too that I won't tell you, but it was a great, great dream. Okay, so I dreamt of all of that. And uh, you know, that was being heavily conscious, but disconnected from the environment compared to when the subjects are completely gone, so they are not there early in sleep. And when you compare it, you find these areas in green and blue, this posterior part of the cortex back here, those are the areas that if you are dreaming, they are just fine. If you lose consciousness, so you have dreamless sleep, the causal interactions inside, as I mentioned to you before, break down because there is this called delta activity, which essentially means the neurons cannot talk to each other well. So we showed that, and the nice thing is this is, you're still sleeping, so outwardly you are there, sleeping, eyes closed, doing nothing, the brain looks the same, does the same things, but no, as predicted, that's what happens in the brain. And one last piece of experiments before closing with the last part. This is something we worked on for the past four years, and it has to do with a very counterintuitive prediction of IIT. IIT says, because of what it says consciousness is and what it takes to have it, it says that you can also be conscious if the neurons in the appropriate part of the cortex here in the back primarily are fine, but they're not active at all. As long as they are fine and they can interact, even though they are not firing, meaning spiking, shouting, whatever you want to call it, you still would be conscious. And I thought that in many traditions, especially spiritual tradition, both Buddhist, Zen, but also some Christian traditions, there are some states that have been called states of pure presence, or sometimes pure awareness, naked awareness, there are different names, but they essentially refer to the same state of consciousness. It's the state in which the subject is vividly there, so there is something it is like to be, but there are no thoughts, no object, you're not seeing stuff or hearing stuff. No self, it's not you, there's just existence, okay? And usually it's described like a vast luminous expanse, that's how they describe it. And we now study many of these from different traditions, and we predicted that what we would find is that in the brain you find that activity is minimal, and that's exactly what you see here, this gamma activity we recorded with EEG, this is just the surface of the brain projected down, the details don't matter is usually reflective of neurons being very active. And when you are in this state here, the neurons are minimally active. We can't really record them, we can't go inside until we find an epileptic meditator, which we haven't found yet. But there is almost no activity in the brain and consciousness is there. This is against every scientific notion that you know, people think it's information processing. So all of this brings me to the last part, which is some of the implications given that this theory explains a lot about consciousness and has been tested and so far definitely is so good, okay? If we take its lead, where do we go in asking difficult questions like animal consciousness, organoids, collective consciousness, and above all, artificial consciousness, okay? And I want to mostly focus briefly on artificial consciousness because it's becoming urgent and important. So many most of my colleagues in neuroscience, psychology, cognitive neuroscience, and also most philosophers, do think that future robots, or even just computers running very powerful AI, since they're going to do all the things we can do, 
they are going to be as conscious as we are. What else is there after all? That's what I think, okay? So because they do all we do, they would feel all we do, whatever that means. They have no explanation for what that means. Okay. But IAT clearly indicates, and we have demonstrated that, that you may have a system which is functionally equivalent. So a computer, for instance, that does everything you do, properly programmed, driven by AI. But because of the way it's built, because of how computers are organized, doesn't matter what the software is, they will not be able to support this big file structure and therefore be conscious. In fact, there will be zero consciousness. They will disintegrate into many, many, many things that count for nothing that I call ontological dust. Okay, that's what I call them. So it's nothing. They act as if they were like you or better than you, but there is absolutely nothing there, which is what many people, I think, rightly intuit, but all the experts think otherwise, okay? And so, to quote Friedrich Larkin, okay, what is it like to be a computer? No, si no sound, no touch or taste or smell, nothing to think with, nothing to love or link with. Okay, so he was very perceptive. He wasn't talking about computers, though. And that leads to a dissociation, which we should be very well aware of, between conscience and intelligence. IT says that you can have incredible intelligence, and we're beginning to witness that, and no consciousness whatsoever. There's nobody there. It's dust. You can also have potentially high consciousness. I'm indicating an organoid there, but in, an organoid in certain conditions that we don't do in the lab, okay? Which might be conscious, at least of space or something like that, and stupid, do nothing, not be capable, doesn't even have inputs and outputs, for instance, okay? The place where you can find conscious and intelligence go together is actually through evolution, is for a story which I won't be able to tell you today, if the forces that make, you know, you have to be conscious, fine, but also be able to survive in the environment, then the two things go together, which is why we are both conscious and intelligent, usually, but not always. Okay. And so now, to finish, what does IAT say then about our place in nature? And why is that sort of relevant, finally, for mental health? I told you about Galileo, and essentially all science since his time that takes this extrinsic view. Forget the subject, forget us, let's just study what's out there. And that was fantastically successful, no doubt. And so let's then say that we are not at the center of the universe, far from it. We are not creation's best product. We are just some product of chance and necessity, as I said at the beginning, and above all, all we are are biological machines or, you know, bad computers that can fail, okay? Passengers going along for the ride, we can't really determine our fate, so to speak. And we're not even unique because smarter beings than us will take over, or even if they don't take over, they would be better than we are. Now, if IT is right, and I definitely think it is, we go in the opposite direction and start in the reverse order, it's exactly the other way around for all these points. It's almost hard to believe. It's exactly the other way around. I told you already, computers can be as smart as you want, but they will never amount to nothing, to anything. They really are just tools, as we think they are and always did, rightly so. They are tools that do our bidding. They are not subjects, okay? They are dust. Sorry. And then, this is difficult to explain now, but every thought, every object in your mind, everything you see, everything you feel, is a giant structure that requires a very, very special substrate, as you only find at the moment in the back of our cerebral cortex. That's what it is. It takes that. Whether that is seeing a familiar face, or looking at the sunset, or just feeling the immensity of the mountain as much as it exists for us, because it only exists for us, it doesn't exist for itself, those are forms in the mind. They are not computational processes. And one fundamental consequence of this, again very relevant for mental health, is the following. It also follows that the moment we develop not only sufficient consciousness, but also as we do, sufficient intelligence, so that we can reason, evaluate, and so on, 
Every alternative is a form in the mind. Every choice is a choice in the mind. And we begun, become the ones who actually can change who we are and what surrounds us. Something that I'm sure all of you, after all, believe, because we all know we can do that. But science is telling us the opposite to this day, that you are not really responsible. It's what's happening in your brain, what happened before. No, IT is right. We are 100% responsible once we get adult enough and we understand it is us who make choices. It is us who are responsible for those choices and not our neurons on our brain. In fact, IT says only we exist when we exist and not our brain. And finally, that the individual human consciousness, every individual human consciousness, is the greatest thing that ever was in the known universe. The not known universe, I don't know about. But in the known universe, if you actually measure things properly by what exists intrinsically for itself, not what exists for somebody who is conscious, every conscious human being literally is by far the biggest thing there is, much bigger than stars. In fact, I want to give you this sense as a parting sort of message. You know, astronomers and astrophysicists, not that I have anything to complain about them, but they like to dazzle people with these astronomical numbers, okay? the number of galaxies, the number of stars, the numbers of atoms in the universe, which is this, the number of Planck volumes, the smallest pieces of the universe that you can find out. So this is a huge number, unimaginably large numbers. We have estimated, based on what we think is the substance of consciousness, this phi structure that I briefly illustrate here, but it's only sort of a visual aid, okay, is composed of these powers whose numbers are around this. So these numbers are truly unimaginable, and they dwarf anything in the universe, certainly the number of stars, okay? And if the theory is right, being you right now means that there is something that truly exists for itself, and it is that numerous, and that rich, and that unique. So I hope I can close with this quote of a great physicist, Erwin Schrodinger, who many years ago sort of intuited this. Okay, he was one of the creators of quantum mechanics. He intuited that if it weren't for us, that great universe with those be beautiful stars and mountains that we see would be nothing at all. It would be a play before empty benches. And therefore, properly speaking, it wouldn't even exist. Thank you very much. Oh my goodness. All right, so what I want to do in just a few minutes uh, is, if I can find my slides here, I may need some help finding the slides real quick. I, I want to talk a little bit about how some of the more pragmatic implications of what Dr. Tononi talked about, we're going to try to instantiate here in Eagle Valley. Um, particularly this idea that consciousness has causal power that the experiences you have as a conscious entity can be harnessed in ways that are really valuable for transforming how people feel emotionally and therefore for treating mental illness. So I've got just 10 slides, it's gonna be a fast talk, but as I say, I wanna to try to bring some of it down into the pragmatics that we're going to operationalize. Of course, Dr. Tononi is a colleague in this work uh, here as are several other folks from UW and Emory. We've really assembled a remarkable team to do this work here in the Vale area. So, you know, as Julio said, modern science sees humans as machines. And, you know, you go to medical school, and you see this. You know, the machine idea works great for the liver, it works really, really well for the heart. It doesn't work so well for the brain. And so, you know, psychiatry, and I'm a psychiatrist, but we've imbibed this metaphor that essentially you are a biological machine and your feelings are produced by neurochemicals and depression is a neurotransmitter deficiency and all these sorts of ideas. And if that's who you are, uh, then of course obviously the way to do it is to think about the psychiatrist as a mechanic, not as a priest, not as a therapist, 
not as, as somebody that's got a relationship with a human being, but somebody who says, mm, okay, you, there's a chemical here, I gotta fix it. And if you've been to a psychiatrist, uh, unless you're very lucky, you've probably had this experience where they ask you about symptoms, how you sleep and how you eat, and, right? Um, and then they give you a pill. Because symptoms are the output of a mechanical brain, and we're not so much interested in sort of the larger human stories that I think, um, for many of the reasons that Dr. Tononi was talking about, are what actually drive many, many mental disorders in many of us. So, um, how do we treat, how do we as psychiatrists tend to treat, especially depression, anxiety in the United States? Well, we use standard antidepressants like SSRIs. Um, but, and these agents actually operate by that idea that we're just trying to change non-conscious chemicals in the mind. So, you know, if you think about what antidepressants do, when they work, they work slowly and they slowly change how you feel. I bet I'm not the only person in the room that's had this experience of, if you take Prozac, Paxil, you know, after a couple of weeks, yeah, I feel better. You know, all that stuff that was bothering me, it's not bothering me as much anymore. I can't tell you why. It's just a mystery, right? It's not that I've had some conscious change. It's that something's happened in the biology that's making my conscious experience different. But because they are driving it that way, these agents tend to only work when you're taking them. And many people find that when they stop taking them, <coughs> they crash back into however they felt before. Sometimes, actually, they crash back and felt worse. Now, this is not to say that these agents have been hugely valuable, hugely life-saving. I'm a doc. I prescribe them. But this is just a truth about the limitations. And one of the things that's striking about these agents is, so I'm nervous, I'm anxious, I feel terrible about myself. I start taking an antidepressant. A few weeks later, I'm starting to feel pretty good. I'm starting to feel pretty good. I'm, I'm more confident. And then I'm going out there, and after a few months, I say, you know, I'm feeling really good. I think I'll stop it now, right? I stop it. I haven't learned anything. I start going back to being like this again. I go, oh, crap, I need that, that medicine again. And people go back on it. And this is, this is a very, very common thing. And it, it's tied to this idea that you're, you're pumping a chemical sort of non-consciously into people, and you're subsequently changing their consciousness without addressing consciousness itself as consciousness. And then, of course, as I've sort of indicated, one of the challenges of these agents is many people find that even if they don't work perfectly, if they stop taking them, sometimes they get terrible withdrawal syndromes, but they also then find that they stop working and then they sort of have to go back on them again. And the thing that's amazing about this is these are the problems when these agents work. And one of the great sort of suggestions that this way of viewing humans as biological brain machines is inadequate. Not completely inadequate, because these agents do work, but inadequate enough that it's a problem is the fact that these drugs don't work very well. These are data from the largest antidepressant study that will ever be done, probably in the world. 4,000 people, where they took a bunch of regular old depressed people in doctor's offices, and they gave them an SSRI, a drug called Celexa. And they gave it to them at a high dose, and they gave it to them for a long time, and they were expecting people to do very well, and it was a shockeroo that in fact, depending on which scale you used, only about a quarter to a third of people got a really adequate full response. And the vast bulk of people were left with symptoms that were really problematic. So another problem with the way we currently treat depression with, with antidepressants is that for many people, this machine model doesn't work very well. So here's a question. When was the last time Prozac, Paxil, Zoloft, Lexapro, Celexa, Cymbalta, or Effexor gave you a spiritual experience that gave your life a deeper meaning, or an experience that gave you profound insight into the problems that were making you depressed? The answer is sort of probably never, right? That's not what these agents do. But here we come into this really interesting opportunity to understand psychedelics, because psychedelics are very, very different. And I can assure you, and I encourage you to keep your eye on the news, because a very, very large study that that we were much involved with is going to be coming out in the next few weeks, showing again that, that, that psychedelics, especially one called psilocybin, that's been approved and passed through in the Colorado, you know, this, this thing that's been passed here, has very, very powerful antidepressant effects. And in fact, in people that are very depressed, a single dose, a high dose of psilocybin, produces really powerful antidepressant effects. Not perfect, not going to solve all the world problems, but <laughs> A single pill induces a psychedelic experience that lasts about six or eight hours, and then people report being remarkably less depressed 
for anywhere from six weeks to six months to four years, depending on the study. This is a totally different paradigm, right? How is it possible that something that is biologically active for such a short period of time produces such a long-term therapeutic effect? Well, we don't know, but we know from now many studies that the most consistent thing that predicts that long-term response has to do with the conscious quality that occurs during the psychedelic experience. So if you come in and you're my patient and we, we, we do six to eight hours of preparation so you're ready for it, you come into a room that is specially set up. Example, this is a study that was in the UK. You have two therapists that sit with you. You take the psilocybin. Boom, you have a kind of mind-blowing psychedelic experience. And then we meet with you for a few hours afterwards over the succeeding weeks. If we do it that way, um, if your psychedelic experience has a couple of elements, you are very, very likely to get a longer-term reduction in depression, reduction in anxiety. You're more likely to quit drinking. You're more likely to quit smoking. What are those elements? Well, there's several of them, but these are the two that have been the best studied. The first is something that's been characterized as mystical experience, and you can see here, I'm not going to read it, the elements, but basically, Many people, when they have a, one of these psychedelic experiences in our studies, have a religious experience. They feel profoundly interconnected with things larger than themselves. God, the universe, other people. They often feel that their own little lives are connected with the lives of others in ways that makes their own struggles somehow more understandable, more bearable. It, it's really quite striking, this sort of amazing, as, as Dr. Tunley was talking about, you know, this profound interconnection that people realize exists among all of us, and we just sort of take for granted, right? Boom! It's like you know, people are just, they're dumbfounded by it, and when it happens, they're often profoundly moved. Um, when that happens, and I'll show you in a second, people tend to do better. The other thing, one of the other things that happens is people have something that's called emotional breakthrough, which is a, an older word for this would be catharsis. So I am depressed, and I, people that are depressed often are depressed for reasons. And very often, they don't want to face the reasons that they're depressed for. I, we're all in this boat, right? It's called sort of this sort of repression. And psychedelics have this strange tendency to bring people face to face with whatever they're trying not to face and not to think about. And often to do it in ways that can be very uh, hard, you know? Many of the patients in our studies will cry for the first couple of hours as they sort of face the fact that their parents weren't right with them or the fact that they are repeating, you know, sort of painful patterns with their children. There's, there's an array of things that happen. But studies show that if people see it, accept it, and feel like they can either change it, or if it's something that can't be changed, for instance, like I'm dying of cancer, and I'm going to die of cancer, but I've had an amazing life, everybody dies. If, you know, if those sort of things happen, people tend to get really powerful long-term benefits. And, and very often, when the emotional breakthrough happens, it sets in motion that mystical experience. Because once you've worked through sort of your own mishigash, to borrow the Yiddish word, very often it opens up a space where you realize that you're part of this wonderful, larger, beautiful, collective world. There are all sorts of studies that show this. Th this is a complicated picture, but it just shows that in one of the largest studies, both of these experiences, when they occur consciously, during the psychedelic experience, produce long-term antidepressant effects. So this is why I talk about psychedelics as a consciousness-based treatment, as opposed to, say, standard antidepressants that are non-conscious-based treatments. Psychedelics really appear to work by inducing conscious experiences that make people feel different about who they are and where their place is in the world and what their potential futures are. And it's, it, you know, people remember these experiences for their entire life. In fact, they, we, we, Dr. Snoni and I are doing a study where we're trying to see if we can get people to forget their psychedelic experiences. We co-administer a drug that induces amnesia. We've had to keep raising the dose of the drug because they forget their name, but they remember that they had an interaction with their dead grandma, you know. I mean, so it's really quite striking, the power of these experiences to stay in the memory. Um, which brings us to the study that we're going to do in Vail, the first study. So uh, one of the things that the first study in Vail is designed to do is to ask this question. Can we find ways to extend and deepen the conscious memory for the psychedelic experience so that in an embedded, embodied, felt sense, people 
remember and feel the power of that experience, that conscious experience, can we extend and deepen it um, so that if we do that, the psychedelic experience can produce a longer term uh, you know, antidepressant response. One of the things that researchers have observed is that when people that have chronic depression and benefit from a psychedelic begin to relapse into depression again, they say things like, I can remember the experience, but I, no longer, I don't feel it anymore. It's not with me that way. Um, we think that if we can help people can, can sort of hold on to that experience in that emotionally salient way, we can avoid people having to go and begin to use psychedelics the way they use Prozac, right? So in FDA land, where I also hang a hat, you know, they're saying, well, it's just a drug. So, you know, we expect people are going to have to do it three, four, five times a year. And that may be true, and that may be okay. But our interest is, can we, in fact, then sort of harness the power of consciousness so you don't have to do psilocybin three times a year. You can, you, the experience can extend in ways that you don't need to keep turning to a drug. You can, you can sort of enact this self-contained within your own body and brain sort of pattern of behavior and activity that protects you from being depressed. So it's a fancy slide, and I'm going to come over here and just read it because I'm not going to tell you everything in it. But we're going to basically test this idea. But this study has some really interesting sort of features. The first is that everybody that comes into this study in, in, in the Vale area, uh, all the residents of Eagle Valley, are going to receive a dose of psilocybin. So one of the commitments that Chris, and I, Chris Lindley and I made at the very beginning of this is that we're not going to randomize half the people to a placebo. You know, God bless you and stay warm. For the treatments that have data supporting them, like psychedelics, everybody gets that. So that is a benefit that people get, and that's a benefit that folks will get free of charge because they're coming into a study, and that is a, sort of a beautiful thing about this. That it makes this, you know, you're not going to have to go down to the local guy in Denver and buy some mushrooms, or you can't buy mushrooms, but your buddy. No, you come in, you get state-of-the-art treatment. It'll be free of charge because it's a study, but you're also going to contribute to our scientific understanding because we're going to ask this cutting-edge question of how can we extend the felt sense of the psychedelic experience. So the second thing it's going to do is it's going to allow us to explore, can we enhance and extend that sort of power of the psychedelic experience? And then how are we going to do it? So interestingly, um, we're going to do it uh, initially with a very simple, non-invasive technique that's been pioneered by a colleague of Dr. Tononi and I's called transauricular vagus nerve stimulation. It's kind of a mouthful. But you may have heard of vagus nerve stimulation. It, it, they, you know, they, they use it for depression where they plant it in your chest. and it <laughs> But what people have found more recently is that because the vagus nerve goes up into the brain and sort of stimulates memory, um, if you pair the stimulation with a context that you want to strengthen, you get a much more benefit, right? So it's approved for stroke, right? So in stroke patients, you know, I'm paralyzed here. Every time I move my finger, you get a little zap, right? And there's a whole biology for how this works. But the cool thing is, we're not, we can't implant people, things in people's neck, but there's a branch of this nerve that comes right out here to the ear. And they've shown that if you just hook up little electrodes to it, and we do it, we give people this in, in a suitcase, they do it at home, that if you do this for like 20 minutes twice a day, you can really enhance your sort of whatever you're trying to strengthen, right? So for instance, our colleagues have shown that in, in newborns that can't suckle correctly and they're about to go get a G-tube, if you hook them up to this and every time they go, you give them a zap, you can keep 80% of them from having to get a G-tube, right? So it's pretty cool. It's low tech, it's, it's scalable, it's not expensive, um, and it's really cool. Now, this study is going to do other things also. But again, the point of that I'm, the reason I'm talking about this is because the idea here is we're, we're, we're harnessing this consciousness-based treatment with psilocybin, and we're trying to figure out how can we enhance the consciousness power so that we don't end up just using it like another drug, that we're actually using it like a truly consciousness-transforming thing that then people's lives are set off in a different motion and they don't need to continue to have drugs all the time. So with that, I'm going to thank you and stop. And I don't know how far over time we went. I'm scared to ask. But uh, do you want to maybe we should take some questions? Yeah, yeah. If both of you could take a seat. OK. And do some questions. All right. Um, we want to give everybody a long time to ask any questions you might have. So oh, sure.
Can you all hear me? OK, perfect. Uh, for those of you I don't know, and fortunately, I know most of you, my name is Chris Lindley. I'm with Eagle Valley Behavioral Health and Bell Health. And we want to just provide some opportunity to fire away any questions you might have. And if you don't have any, don't worry, because I have a whole bunch from what I just heard. Um, so anybody in the audience have a question? Yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah, so it does. So, you know, it's interesting. There's a fairly robust data set that shows that if you treat people with, with an antidepressant and they get remitted, they're, they're, they're not depressed anymore, or you treat people with talk therapy and they remit, and then you take away both of those things, the people that got the antidepressant crash when you take away the antidepressant. The talk therapy people don't. Uh, they do, but not at the same rate, right? So. I conceptualize psychedelic treatment as being more akin to talk therapy than to drug therapy in that uh, we think that the dynamics of the treatment are like um, like a sort of a supercharged talk therapy. And there, there's a sort of cliche in the field that, that uh, psychedelic experience is often like a year of psychotherapy in a day. And I actually think that there's something to that because uh, people, you know, that is often the case. Now, what psychedelics do, you know, and it's interesting, I didn't say this in my talk, but I, I can tell you that in studies, our patients come in, they are severely depressed, all right? And when the psychedelic works, the full effect is apparent within a day or two. So it's not like standard antidepressants. That experience changes something, right? Um, it turns out that the same thing is true in psychotherapy, but it's not nearly as widely known. There's a whole literature on something called sudden gains and sudden losses. And so researchers that study psychotherapy have shown that, that if you're in, in psychotherapy and you, know, you start out really depressed and when you're done you're undepressed, that, that most of the time that doesn't come because you get a little better, a little better, a little better, a little better. What happens is you're going along, you're going along, and then there's a session where something happens. Boom, your score, you get less depressed. You go along, boom. That, that people that have these sort of saltations or sudden improvements do much better. So psychedelics even look like psychotherapy there because what they seem to do is to induce a, an incredibly powerful sudden gain because they, they just are so powerful at, at reshaping people's perceptions acutely. So yeah, it, there's definitely a place for talk therapy. And in a better world, most people who are struggling with depression that's not like psychotic or the people with schizophrenia, the, uh, you know, most folks, uh, which, and there's a, it's a horrible burden, would do better to get psychotherapy as a first intervention and not medications. Not so easy to do in the United States, of course, because psychotherapy is time consuming, it's expensive, it's not always covered by insurance, but the data would suggest that it's the optimal first treatment in general. Doesn't work for everybody, but as a first move, it's better than starting up on an antidepressant. Not something I would have said 20 years ago, by the way. Tina. Yes, okay, good. So in, in our studies, and it's sort of standard for the field, here you go, you're depressed, we're gonna screen you, we're gonna make sure that you, know, you qualify. You come in, and before you get to psilocybin, in our studies at least, at USONA Institute, you're gonna spend six to eight hours with two people that are, th we call them facilitators, but they're, they're really therapists. They're gonna be with you during the psychedelic experience. And in those six to eight hours, we're gonna talk about, you know, how do you understand your depression? What made you depressed? If, you know, what would you be looking for in a treatment like this? We're gonna tell you about what you might expect to have happen should you get psilocybin. Now, in the, in the Vail study, everybody's gonna get psilocybin. It's gonna make this really easy, because we can tell you, you're gonna get psilocybin, and this is probably what's gonna happen. In our studies, we give half the people placebo. But, so, six to eight hours, and, and during that time, the therapists or facilitators are also trying to figure out, are you okay to get psilocybin? Because you know, we screen people, but you know, uh, it's, I call it the oh, by the way phenomenon. You know, I, I, I screen you and you say, no, I don't. I, I'm not, you know, no, I'm not drinking drug. And then you slip, oh, well, I'm drinking a bottle of vodka today, but you know, I'm handling it, right? You know. So we kind of suss it out. At the end of that time, uh, that's the end of that, the dosing day. You come in, um, 
almost always, the, the room, it varies a little bit, but you, it's not a hospital room, right? So usually it's a couch, there's some nice stuff on the wall. We try to make it look more like a living room so that you feel more comfortable. Your facilitators are there with you. In studies, we get your blood pressure and heart rate first because interestingly, psychedelics are actually a stressor, right? They're not a, they're not a chill pill. Your heart rate goes up, your blood pressure goes up, your stress hormones go up. So if you're already hypertensive, we, we, we can't treat you, at least in studies, right? But if you're cool, then we give you a pill. And it's a, uh, I, you know, when patients talk to me, it's quite a moment, right? Because now you understand that this pill, it's, it's like the matrix, right? It's like whatever pill it was that he took that popped him out of the, you're right, you know, you take the pill. And then we say, you know, uh, the, the, the preferred thing that you do is that you lay down on the couch or the bed. We're going to give you eye shades so you're not distracted by things that, you know, when the walls start kind of breathing, that, not useful, right? And then we're going to ask you to listen to music. And there's actually a little scientific literature showing that there's this very powerful interaction between music and the psychedelic state. And people who respond to the soundtrack that they hear actually get a better antidepressant response. It's interesting. The music tends to be... Uh, it, no words, because we don't want you to, you know, start singing, you know, uh, you know, uh, you, uh, you know, some of the Beatles, you know, in the, but and, and often kind of evocative music, right? And you lay down, and now you wake, and let's as assume you get to psilocybin. About 40, 35 minutes, 45 minutes in, uh, you'll notice if you've got the eye shade on that that colors are looking kind of strange, you know. And then you'll sort of notice that, that um, you're starting to see things, often geometric, what they call entoptic forms. The brain's kind of wired this way. There's a lot of, y there's a, y so you start seeing that stuff. And then at some point, and it's a strange thing, because it's not the hallucinations. They don't predict anything. At some point, you're gonna, the music or something's gonna trip you, and you're gonna go in generally in one of a couple of directions in our studies, especially if you're depressed. Many people, the first place they go is into profound sadness, right? It's just overwhelming. And uh, you, you, whatever it is that you've been holding back on, it's right in front of your face. And if you fight it, you're going to have a hard time. But if you can go with it, uh, as frightening as it is, very often what happens is you move through it. Now, this can take an hour or two. The peak effect usually happens at about three hours. Um, or you may be somebody, there's other people... Um, uh, you know, there's other people that will go right into this sort of joyous, mystical experience. Lucky folks, right? Because that also predicts a good outcome. Some people, many people do both. First the boohoo, and then the... And then, uh, you know, it depends, but usually about, yeah, I don't know, five, six hours into it, you start coming down. And you start feeling like you're back to normal. You're not as normal as you think you are. It's a really interesting thing, but you're no longer having these... You're not, you're not seeing stuff, and, and the emotionality has calmed down. In our studies, we usually keep you for seven or eight hours. Some studies that keep you overnight, uh, but we don't always do that in our studies. And but when you're when you're back to semi-normal, you have to have somebody come pick you up. So if he's with you, he's got to come get you, right? You know, and you go home. The next day, you come back, and we spend two hours with you, and we sort of talk about the experience and and you know what came up for you, what did it mean for you, d what is it, you know does it say anything perhaps for your depression. Uh, generally, the approach taken in these studies is a kind of Rogerian, non-directive approach. So we're kind of letting you find your way and make your meaning here. There are other psychotherapies that might be more effective. Nobody's ever studied those. But in our studies, we, we, we don't want to be overly, you know, psychotherapeutic, especially because the FDA has kind of got an issue with this, unfortunately. But we sit with you, and you can imagine it's quite a challenge, though, for the folks in our studies that got placebo. Generally, nothing happened. They laid there for six hours. Their one chance of a miracle cure, right, shot. Right. They're pissed off, and then you get to sit with the, the, the facilitators. They really complain about this. It's, it's, a, it's a great gift to the world that the, the facilitators do this. And then a week later, we have you come back for an hour, and a week later, we have you come back for an hour. And that's what we do in our studies. Now, there may be more optimal ways to use these agents, but this, this way of doing it has been the standard since the psychedelic renaissance started again around 2000. And it comes out of actually sort of experience from the 50s or 60s, because in the early days, they'd give you LSD, strap you to a gurney in a horrible white room and come back and check on you in five hours. And people, you know, they had panic attacks and it was a nightmare, you know. So they figured out though that, that if you did it right, instead of it being horrible, it could actually be hard sometimes, but therapeutically useful. Questions, Anne.
there is yes, so there is in fact no prescribed way of doing this. This is part of what I discovered because I do not work in an ICU. Okay, the doctors themselves are complaining because they don't know what they should be doing, how to advise patients, and it's their own gut feeling whether this is a good case or a bad case. The family and relatives sense that, you know, well, it's hopeless anyhow, or no, we'll try everything we can no matter what. You know, all of those things, sure, if you have documents, they can help sway in one direction, but there is no way. So the point here is mostly that some knowledge is always a difficult decision no matter what, but some knowledge is better than no knowledge. And now that we have a tool that's able to tell you basically with extraordinary sensitivity and specificity, which are the two main things, whether somebody is there or not now, okay, that should be used. Now, the, as usual, the problem is to get it into the ICU, make it small enough, have the insurance pay for it, the usual issues. But it will not be the final solution because if you're not there, it doesn't mean that you may not be there later. However, if you're there, definitely you should not do withdrawal of care. So I think that much we should uh, you know, pursue. But there is no regulation. Cynthia. Yeah, so the data, I think, overall suggests that many people would probably benefit from what you're talking about, right? Now, the more that happens, the more adverse events are going to happen. I, I can promise you that because it's already happening, right? So w one of the problems we have in this country is that everything is perfect until it's terrible. And I, I, I've seen this. Mm. We're the worst in mental health because we don't really have the answer to anything. We keep thinking everything's a miracle cure, and as soon as it's not a miracle cure, it's worthless, even when there's some worth there, right? So the, the psychedelic went from stigmatized to they're going to be the salvation of the world to now now we're starting to get into the kind of negative kind of thing. But there are data for this, and it suggests that, that if you look at well-being, most people who do a psychedelic, even actually in a non-clinical setting, although I don't always recommend that, but even there, people generally report that they've had a well-being response from it. Nobody has done the study that needs to be done, although we're going to actually kind of do it uh, in a study at, at uh, UW where we take healthy volunteers that have a little bit of a decrement in their well-being, treat them, and see you know, what it does to their well-being. That, that stick around because in a couple of years we'll know that. But, but yeah, I, I think that these agents are very different than Prozac, Paxil, Zoloft, Selex, Electro, those agents in that they do seem to offer potential for folks that want to sort of enhance their well-being. Um, are they going to solve life's problems? Absolutely not. But they do seem to hold that value, and that's another unique thing about them. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we'll probably do 18 to you're too old to safely do it. Um, you know, I'm 65, almost 66. So, you know, I got to keep raising the age limit that I think <laughs> is okay. You know, as you begin to realize, as my mom, when she was like 90, said, oh, she's so young, she's 83. But, you know, you're really old when you're 90, right? So, uh, you know, so it's somewhere out there in the 70s, people will probably tap out. We won't do people younger than 18. Would people younger than 18 benefit? Maybe. So, you know, one of my weird hats is I, I'm the director of, of research for a nonprofit entity that is a drug company, basically, but trying to develop psychedelics not for profit, but as a nonprofit. It, it's very resonant with what we're doing that way. But in those studies, we're constantly dealing with the FDA. And so the FDA has a mandate that if you approve an antidepressant in adults, you got to study it in kids, right? So we've been kind of trying to make this argument that we want to kind of be careful about that. We've tried to, we were going to go into e Europe a few years ago, and I, I was talking with this super, super specialist that deals with regulatory stuff in Europe. And I said, uh, and she said to me, you probably won't have to give psilocybin to kids younger than three. I said, I said, I said what? And she said, we give Haldol to three-year-olds. Haldol is a very powerful antipsychotic agent that has a lot of side effects, right? So 
you know, score her, right? I mean, I was like, well, damn. So, so one of the, there is a study out there where somebody probably should look at people starting at maybe age 15 or 16 to see whether or not giving these agents in kids that are high risk at that time might set them on a different life course, you know? So I sometimes think about it like railway tracks, you know? Imagine they're just one degree off, you know? You can go for a long way and they look like they're parallel, but you go out 20, 30 miles and, right? So, you know, if I can bump a 16-year-old three degrees, you know, it can make a huge difference. And because of the work I do, you know, everybody wants to come tell me about their psychedelic experiences, right? I mean, it's a, it's a you know, liability of my profession. Many people, though, will tell me, I, I was on the ropes when I was 19, 20, and, you know, I did say, many people our age, you know, because the, I was on the ropes, and it actually helped me tremendously. They're not doing it in the clinical, but to your point, right, that it just, it helped them. They saw life differently. It, it changed their course. I know many people in very high positions whose lives were changed by a psychedelic experience back in the 70s or 60s or 70s, you know, these old guys or old women that, you know, and, and so they just never talked about it because, you know, it was un-PC to talk about it. So there may be, and of course, you know, in, in indigenous cultures, especially in, in the Americas, mm. if you were going to get a psychedelic, uh, most people only got a psychedelic once. Only the shamans or the shamans got it repeatedly. Generally, it would be at puberty. And, and they'd be out looking for their spirit animal. In other words, how do they connect with their community? So it's sort of an untapped area. But, but the FDA, we, we can't do it in people younger than 18 at, at this point. Okay. Yes. Oh, absolutely. So. When these agents, when, you know, I mentioned that they were just tying people to gurneys back in the late 50s and people freaking out. When they began to realize that these agents had therapeutic potential, and of all places where it was first really realized was in Saskatchewan. I mean, end of the world, right? Out in the middle of nowhere, right? But there was a guy named Humphrey Osmond who was a psychiatrist, and they had these agents. And, and he said that he had observed that people that had the DTs, you know, the bad delirium tremens, they go psychotic. And very often they never drink again because it's so terrifying, right? He said, you know what? Psychedelics make people psychotic. Maybe we can give people psychedelics and they'll stop drinking. And so they started doing that work. The two things in the 50s and 60s that were, that were most supported as potential targets for psychedelics were end-of-life anxiety and people dying of cancer and drinking and drugging. Now, there are companies that are actively commercially developing psychedelics for uh, alcohol use disorder. And one of the largest studies that's been published to date in the field, done at NYU by a guy named Michael Bogenschutz, was in people that had, you know, bad alcohol use disorder. It's an interesting study. He gave people a couple of, of psychedelic experiences. He combined it with a standard sort of uh, therapy, psychotherapy for, for drink, for, for substance use disorder, right? The control condition was just the therapy without the psychedelics. The therapy worked pretty well, but the psychedelics worked way better. So if I, if I had to bet, where are these agents going to eventually be most effective? We work in depression. Depression's a huge need. They're going to be effective there, but the challenge there, as we talked about, is people that are chronically depressed, they begin to lose the effect, and, you know. But conditions where you're struggling with a single problem, and you have a psychedelic conscious experience that addresses that problem, I think those are the conditions that these agents are going to be the most effective for because mm -hmm. that's where they're going to produce the longest term outcome. So I'll give you an example from a very early study of a psychedelic. It was way, way back. It, it, but it was a woman who was in her middle age. She had two or three children. She was a very bad alcoholic. She was in total denial about it. Somehow her husband got her to come into this very early study. She got a high dose of a psychedelic. And she had a psychedelic experience in which she saw that she was eating her children. She was cutting them up with a fork and knife and eating their innards, right? And it was the most horrible thing that she'd ever experienced. And then she realized, that's what my alcoholism is doing. And she stopped drinking. That, I think, is, that speaks to this sort of consciousness and the, the power of a consciousness treatment. So I think that's a place where these agents are going to be especially powerful because we know that a lot of people quit drinking, have an AA-type experience, right, where they hit bottom and something happens, right? And psychedelics, to your question about psychotherapy, that's what they seem to do, right? So another place where they're probably going to be extremely effective is in post-traumatic stress disorder where you're struggling with a single sort of horrific thing that you can reconceptualize, and then end of life. 
So, you know, if your problem is that you're devastated, you're dying of cancer, and you have an experience that makes you understand it differently, it really sort of, you've kind of dealt with the problem. So, yes, substance abuse, and, and one of the things that we're going to do in the Vail study that's very novel is we're going to let people in that have some degree of substance use. We're going to really recruit people that are the patients in Eagle Valley Behavioral Health. And we can do it because uh, th the problem is going to be that the people with substance abuse are going to get better outcomes probably, but that's okay, right? So, so we're going to actually begin to be able to look at this, that if you have a substance use problem and you're depressed, it, you know, this is going to be a study where we're going to be able to let people in, and that's going to be also very novel. So one more question um, that I think will pull both of your talks together. So psychedelics work in a conscious state, and Chuck and I have talked many times, as we believe, I think, that it increases your consciousness. With your theory and your new ability to measure it, are you, have you guys thought about measuring either the increase or decrease of consciousness under a psychedelic state? <laughs> we certainly have, yeah. and we also have already tried that. But I think the point here is that it's not so much the quantity of consciousness that changes, it's very specific, it's what you experience. You know, we all float more or less always the same level of consciousness. People like to talk about consciousness expanding or more intense. Reality is, it's essentially just the quality of the experience that changes, not so much the quantity. The okay. quantity only changes when you fall asleep. So what we need to do is figure out better ways of characterizing the quality. Which of is what we're working on. But we're, gonna, we're taking a run at it here. So one of the things we're doing, this is where Dr. Tenori is a, a, a collaborator on this, is we're going to so we're going to use a version of the thing he was talking about for the ICU mm -hmm. to detect whether consciousness is present or not. It, it's a little bit of a different assessment, but to assess, you know, after the psychedelic experience, not during. But you know, if people say I'm I'm feeling very different about things, can we see some sort of signature yeah. in the in the wiring of the brain with something called neuroplasticity? So that's one of the. There's a number of really cutting edge things we're going to do in Vail. I, we don't have time to talk about all of them, but that's one of them. And this is right. Measure this plasticity yep. with this TMS that I showed you before, the knocking on the brain and the response of the brain. That's the first time it will be done for psychedelics. In the sure. world, here. Yeah. yeah. So. We have one more question. So in bold endeavor, yeah. Yes. Yes, they will for scientific reasons, but they will not have to be treatment resistant. So one of the cool things about where I hang my hat in the drug development world is we don't just study treatment resistance. Commercial entities do that because that's where the, probably the reimbursement money is. We're studying MDD, and we're going to do the same thing here. So people that meet criteria for major depression will be eligible to come into this study. There's some evidence that if you're taking an SSRI or an atypical antipsychotic, those agents interact with the same system in the brain and they may blunt the effect of the psychedelic. So we have to take people off. That's, that's not an easy thing to do, but it's a, it's a pretty nice trade-off, right? Because folks, in this study, it's a really nice trade-off because they don't have to worry that they got a 50% chance of okay. getting a placebo. Right, they get it. Bjorn. Yeah, three years, maybe four years. Yeah, yeah. It, it, you know, we, we if we're running at full steam, we'll try to do three, four patients a month, basically. Yeah. There's it, there's a lot of with each patient, but yeah. but we're 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 going after psychedelics in, in multiple facets here at Bell Health. So we're going to do a DEA study, which will take us probably seven or eight months from today before we can launch it. We're hoping to be have it launched this time next year. We'll be doing the study, and then the study will go multiple years after that. But we're also watching the legislative action here in the state of Colorado. And if we as a hospital can become a healing center under the new legislation, we will certainly do that if it doesn't jeopardize our Medicare licensure. So because we're a hospital entity, we have to follow federal regulations. And our chief legal counsel is up here today, Kevin. And so- It's all A-OK, -okay, right? Kevin? Right, so <laughs> to the extent that we can do it within our traditional healthcare model under both state and federal law, we certainly will. But at the same time, we're also gonna look at how would we potentially do this on the private side within Bell Health, because 
to both of their points, we know these therapies work. We know they're as effective or more effective than the model that has been in place for 40 or 50 years. And we know that those long-term effects of SSRIs, benzodiazepines, are challenging for many. We would rather have our providers, which are psychotherapists, licensed clinical social workers, psychologists, and psychiatrists, oversee the administration of psilocybin and other psychedelics, then leaving it up to the wind which someone will fill that gap if we don't do it. And so we to have some rigor and fellowship, we're going to track it every way we can, but all within the regulations of the law as the law changes in the future. Art. Uh, well, we will draw largely from people that are already in the health system. Um, you don't have a Starbucks here. Starbucks are great for recruiting people because depressed people like a lot of coffee. I, I have recruited whole studies from Starbucks, but we will, the, the equivalent of, I think there's a veil coffee. So, you know, we will advertise, right? Because you can get patients that way. Um, I, we will probably open it up to folks in Summit County. I, I, there, I don't know about people on the other side of the veil pass, but, you know, but we'll probably make this available to people in the larger area. We might make it available to people down at Grand Junction. Um, so basically, that's it, you know. But, but one of the things, and Chris touched upon this, and this is another really, really novel thing we're going to try to do, or we are going to do. So right now, so remember you asked me, like, what's it like to have a psychedelic experience? I said, you come and you meet your facilitators, right? And then the, the, you have the day, and then we see you for four, for the hours, and then bye, right? And back you go, right? Nobody has yet looked at administering these agents within the context of a mental health system so that the facilitators are the people that you're going to see a month from now, two months from now, that is integrated into a system. It's crazy. Nobody's done that, but we're going to do it. And so, so that's the other thing. That's another reason why I think we're going to preferentially try to draw from within, because there's a lot of patients yeah. that would benefit from this. So one of the questions we've got when we've talked to other groups about this, they said, well, how are you going to get people to do this? That is not our problem. Um, <laughs> our providers get asked every single day. I'm certain 20 of you, 30 of you, or maybe all of you will ask Chuck, how do you go do this beforehand? Because that's what normally happens after these presentations. So it's not going to be an issue of recruitment. Unfortunately, the issue is going to be who gets to do it first and who has to wait. That's right. Yeah. So, so just as an example, yeah. the study we did at USONA had 100 people. We had a waiting list. What's, what's a large waiting list for 100 people? 1,000 people? We had 20,000 people right. on our waiting list. And, and it was an ugly scene because right. I cannot tell you how many people called up and said, I mean, frankly, I'm going to kill myself. If I can't, I, this is the end of the line. This is what I'm talking about, about unrealistic hype, though, too, though, right? right. The, the, the Buddha said a long time ago, life is suffering, you know. But people are so desperate for this. The, yeah, the problem is that we're going to have a waiting list. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we're going to have to watch people on the waiting list, make sure that they, you know. Let's, ma'am in the hat. Uh, ketamine is a different agent. It has a different effect on the brain, but it does have psychedelic properties, and it can be used as a psychedelic, and people are doing that. Um, ketamine also has just direct antidepressant effects, more like Prozac, Paxil, Zoloft. You take it, and about 60% of people that have not responded to standard antidepressants will feel better for a week after a single treatment, but then most of them relapse. That's the difference with, with uh, something like psilocybin, where even people that have been chronically depressed on average will stay undepressed for two or three or four or five months. So it's, it's different that way. But people are doing it, and I don't know if you want yeah. to say anything about it. So we, we're working to bring ketamine to this valley. We actually have a ketamine clinic in our new Uyghurs Family Mental Health Clinic. It's all set up. We're working through a few logistical issues. But what we're also seeing is just the the quick emergence of psilocybin and the availability of it also as well, not only in this valley but across the United States, is working quicker to push this study to have it more readily available because we believe, looking at the data, the effects of psilocybin outweigh the effects of ketamine. So be, we'd rather bring a more standardized, better treatment than something that is already available. Yeah. Have you been moved from medicine <laughs> On a monthly basis, more or less, yes. I, I, we have five children and an angry uh, ex-spouse, so I, <laughs> I'm a little constrained, but, yeah. but twist my arm that I have to come to yeah. Vail. I, I lived in Denver back in the 80s, and I've been coming to Colorado since 67. 
I mean, it's been sort of like a religion with me. So it's not very hard to get me out here. Dan. Absolutely. Um, well, like all drugs, they have side effects. Most of the side effects occur on the day of dosing. So many people will get a headache. Sometimes the headache will last a day later. People get nauseated. Sometimes they throw up. Not, not so often with the pharmaceutical stuff. Um, they will, you see weird stuff, and that can be kind of spooky, right? Um, almost always. We had, through so a 100-person study, we had one person that saw a few things for a couple days afterwards. What we're interested in, and interestingly, so one of the collaborators, uh, we're, you know, it looks like we're UW, but I'm also Emory University in Atlanta, and we have a Center for Psychedelics and Spirituality at Emory, and Emory is going to be a major collaborator along with UW on the work here in Vail Valley. We're pulling them in. We are right now literally in the midst, and I'm behind on it, of a, we're producing this major document about really needing to be aware of spiritual side effects. Because there's been this sort of realization that, you know, if you have a profound spiritual experience, that can be very upsetting. There's a very a wonderful article by a, a very well-known theologian at Harvard who, very depressed, came into a study at Johns Hopkins, so it totally did it right. She wasn't doing it down on a street corner. Two doses of psilocybin. First dose, boom, mystical experience, glorious, wonderful, felt great. Came back two weeks later for the second dose and had this horrific experience of a total loss of meaning in the universe, complete nihilistic collapse. And it messed her, uh, I know her really well, it messed her up, and she's written beautifully about it, uh, um, about that we need to be aware that, that, yes, you know, when you enter into the realm of the sacred, which these agents, whatever we think of as a sacred, can frequently induce, there are risks there also. And, and this, of course, speaks to the importance of then making sure that we have a container for it and so one of the things we're doing at Emory is, you know, there's two therapists or facilitators in the room at Emory. One of them is a chaplain so that we directly address these issues. So, so but, 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 the, but for most people, these agents have far fewer side effects than SSRIs because they're in, they're out, and most people, even if they have a difficult experience, will afterwards tell you, wow, that was so helpful. Don't ever want to do it again, but that was so helpful. So before, we got to quit, right? Yeah, we got to quit. Um, before we give them a huge round of applause, uh, two things I just want to share. For more information about everything that's going on here, you can go to velhealth.org, and you'll see a big button that says Behavioral Health from there. It'll take you not only to the activities that are taking place in the behavioral health side, but we also have our new Vell Health Behavioral Health Innovation Center information up there. We do uh, guest speaks, uh, speaker series like this the first Thursday of every month. Uh, we've now had two amazing speakers present. This is our third offering here today. But every month going forward into um, the future, we're going to bring outside experts to talk about new emerging opportunities and treatments in behavioral space because our ultimate goal is to bring better care here to this valley. And then last before closing, I want to again thank you, Mike Shannon, who not only would Eagle Valley Behavioral Health not be here without him, he was the board chair in 2019 when we went to them as a community and said, we would love Vell Health to take on behavioral health. And he got us there. But he was also the individual that connected us with Chuck Raison. He's the guy that brought me to Wisconsin, and, too. And, and, oh, it just goes on and on. Yeah. yeah. Endless. And Endless. so Mike and Mary Sue Shannon, thank you so much for bringing yeah, this to our community. You. Thank you. And thank both of you guys. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Yeah. All right, we have uh, healthy, non-alcoholic treats out here for everybody, and please continue to ask your questions out there. We have donuts and booze in the parking lot. Yeah. <laughs> okay, can you see what I want to do?